let's start again <laughs> welcome everyone just like everything in this video blog uh we start somewhere and basically i do believe that if you have couples then you can sleep better and you can perform better in a lot of isolated situations in space missions but it, it's a double-edged sword of course right well i will say that i'm biased because i think sleep is re relevant for practically everything that we can think about uh, interpersonal relationship, um, health, cognition, performance, you name it. And there's been a, a ton of research about it already, but right. what is sleeping connected to being in a couple right now? Why is it connected to flying to Mars, for example, now? Obviously, there are multiple factors that can impact how well a person sleeps on Earth. And those factors are played with when you get outside of Earth. So you introduce microgravity and you introduce different light and dark cycles and you introduce very noisy environment for, for the most and um, an active environment. Even if you work in shifts, something that we see from, from you know, Navy vessels that there's always something going on. So even mentally, the person is, it's not very easy to sh shut off and basically tune yourself out of everything that's happening. There's obviously the isolation component, which may or may not impact sleep. But at the, by the time that you select people for a long-term mission, I think the isolation would be more impactful on, on, on emotional regulation, interpersonal relation, rather than necessarily impacting sleep. But we know from, from a lot of Earth-based research that inadequate sleep or insufficient sleep can impair your ability to regulate your emotions and your ability to, to connect to others and work effectively with others. Actually, the, the circadian and sleep interference and its effects on team functioning is one of the NASA HRP uh, human research program milestone. It's one of oh, the, wow. the topics that they are currently funding studies looking at that in particular, because yeah. that's something that we pretty easily could expect will make different. That's before we got into couples, right? Yeah. 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 So with that... We're not a couple. We need to clarify that, I guess. <laughs> we are on-screen couple, but we are not a couple. We're all, we are a really good team. Don't don't, 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 ruin, don't ruin the tension. Leave, leave some secrets. All right. We've gathered here today to talk about relationships in space and what it would take and what it would look like and what would be the challenges of sending people to a long-term mission to Mars, which would mean a few years on Earth preparation and then six, seven months travel time, and then approximately two years on Mars for the first time ever. And then if you come back another six, seven months at least, and that's approximately four years. So we've talked about what would it mean if, if we uh, form a team, let's say, I don't know, 20 people, just a round number that kind of makes sense. What would it be like if we had a couple there, a married couple or two couples? And what would the interaction be when you're working, in your off time with the couple compared to the other team. It's a small team inside a bigger team. And that's if you have one couple in a team. What if you have two couples in a team? So the whole array of- Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna start and I'm, I'm an astrobiologist. I don't know anything about psychology or group dynamics or anything like that. But my two, but like just off the bat, I would say that if you have one couple and they would be like the leaders of the group and actually it would be like a very stable form for everybody having like a pack a situation when you have one couple and they're like husband and wife and they're sort of can be like the leaders of the pack it's a very table what, what you want to have you want to have like a group dynamics which is very stable for four years like you said right so it's interesting to see what would be like a human group dynamics that would remain stable and would help the group effectively uh work under really stressful conditions and way way away from her from earth so i think actually one couple would be a stable regiment actually for the group that's my own two cents. I'm not sure, you know, what the benefit would be to start with couples versus to actually start with a cohesive team that are all single or in a relationship, in a, what would be a very long distance relationship back on Earth. I, I think that if, if couples will be, like official couples will be added to the team, it's going to be, at least in the first couple of expeditions, kind of a case study, right? To see how they actually function as a couple in such an environment. It's going to be hard. I, I don't know. I think for the simplest option would be to take people in uh, or choose people who were 
either single or in a relationship um, on Earth, or like have, have a family and kids or whatever on Earth, and then go to space. We also need to think about the possibility, particularly with the fir first expeditions, that there is a decent chance, we don't know yet for sure, but there's a decent chance that by sending them to Mars, we are killing their ability to procreate later. Because oh, wow. I haven't thought of that. Oh, there, wow. there, was a, there was a 2010 yes. article in Time magazine that said that China uh, requires all female astronauts to be married with children. Already. So, um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not a requirement for the Americans, for sure. Mm, not that we know. <laughs> All right, so so we've we've started uh, deep diving here. I need to introduce the speaker. Well, oh well. yeah. So let's start again. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Just like everything in this video blog, uh, we start somewhere and drive fast. I want to introduce. Afik and Reut. Afik, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? What's your interest in space? And we'll take it from there. So I am an almost PhD in clinical psychology, one month away by the time we are recording this. Thank you. <laughs> All I need at this point is to survive until uh, end of June. I, in, in my past, I served in the Navy. And I think my, my interest in space kind of peaked at that point where I realized some of the really interesting interpersonal dynamics and a focus on main, on optimizing performance in individual and team performance in these very unusual very some would say extreme environments it, it was kind of really what drew me from being in the navy to have an interest in psychology and at the time uh, my commander was a really great supporter of me pursuing my interest in psychology so i took evening classes in psychology that's kind of like how i realized okay i'm, I'm going to be a psychologist one day nowadays I'm in this route to be a clinical psychologist, a clinical neuropsychologist, but I am still a huge space nerd. So I find myself thinking a lot through the lens of what I learn, uh, both in the, in the, through clinical work and research, how can we apply this to? How can we ask those questions in the context of space exploration? How can we test things in space that we cannot do on Earth that actually will contribute to our understanding of what's going, what's happening on Earth? That's kind of how uh, my uh, interest and involvement in space formed around my professional world and I actually met Raoult for the first time tr uh, trying to create a, a project where my interest in I, I did a lot of sleep I'm, I'm doing in, during grad school uh, sleep research and how we can use sleep research findings from earth test them in a Mars analog mission that Raoult was leading in Israel and try to apply those findings in many different Mars analog settings so that we can draw the conclusion that if we see it enough times consistently in those similar but not identical settings, mm. we might be able to assume this will probably be the same on a similar habitat on a different planet. And in that case, it was Mars, but the, the, the technique is, ident is, is similar for different environments. So thank you, Lot. It was an, an very, a very amazing experience. For All the ups well. and downs. <laughs> yes, yes. Very uh, interesting. It was one yeah. of the most interesting, uh, interesting human, human research that we had on uh, DMAR-03 in 2019. And uh, so were you able to reproduce uh, this experiment in different analogs, in different Mars analogs or lunar analogs and, and on Earth anywhere? Right. So not, not yet. That's the, the disadvantages of being a student, but that's definitely in my future. And I think more than being it, doing it by myself necessarily, it's more in the scientific community. There is quite a lot of work that has been done on sleep in, in analog missions, whether it's Mars analog missions or other analog missions. The, the idea would be to try to replicate what others saw. And if you can't replicate that, then I guess the question, why? What was different? Is there a risk that what we know from Earth-based analog missions won't be able to replicate properly in a Mars setting, for example, and so on and so forth? So it's a kind of community effort. Yeah, I mean, uh, fascinating stuff. Just to clarify to our audience, what is an analog mission? Some people don't know that. So analog mission is a space simulation mission that uh, evokes or simulates, simulates one or more uh, conditions that you will have in a real space uh, mission. So, for instance, NASA has an underwater NEMO project next to Key Largo, which is a base where every American astronaut goes to between four to six weeks at a time to do a lot of training and how to work with the 
to Sudan in a hostile environment where you have to work out different tools and communications and everything needs to work underwater. Other places are lava tubes, you have deserts, you have many different cool places where uh, astronauts tend to uh, do their training. And also there's a really big community called the Analog Astronaut Community. We're basically me and Afik and Niv and people who are professionals in their own fields but are not astronauts as the designed or didn't go through courses by NASA or by other space agencies. But we do go out and we do test a lot of technologies and we do test and we do a lot of research and uh, really good outreach capabilities as well are developed there. And it just came back from uh, Biosphere 2, which had the analog conference there, the first one with Dr. Sayan Proctor and Jasper Nal, Pural, sorry, you Pural, I think that's the, the name. And it was absolutely amazing to meet all the people who are doing different types of analog. And I met with people who are hydronauts. They have uh, facilities underwater and you meet people from Iceland who go into these lava tubes in Iceland and of course in Hawaii you have huge lava tubes as well and people are doing really interesting research I have to say totally doable to do like a lunar simulation or Mars simulation today what I really liked about your experiments that you had those really nice rings (laughs) <laughs> that some of them didn't work. I remember that as well. But it was relatively, it looked like a simple setup that the astronauts themselves didn't have to worry about, which is really important because you don't want your astronauts or your analog astronauts spending more 15 times, 50% of their time just, you know, writing down questionnaires and, you know, making all these psychological questionnaires. So if you can have this setup like Afik had, which was very intelligently designed, then you can get all the data that you need without really taking out precious time from the astronaut's own time during the day, which is very hectic, it's very compressed, and it's very detailed. It, really, it was a really good setup, I thought. Anyways, back to relationships and sleep and stuff. <laughs> Take it away. I, I was wondering if uh, we should introduce you now, but after all this analog... So hello, everybody, again. You should watch the other videos if you haven't. Mm-hmm. I'm good friends with Annie from like 2015, 16. And uh, I'm an astrobiologist. I did my PhD in UNSW in Sydney, Australia. And I work in extreme inf- extreme environments. I do other stuff as well. A lot of outreach, a lot of analog. I set up a few NGOs in Israel, which are mostly related to colonizing Mars. And I really, really like space exploration. Like I'm a really, um, <laughs> I'm a geek. I'm a space geek. And Niv is a space geek too. And I think uh, I think as well. So there we go. That's there, the content. There we go. Uh, there's no right place to begin. So as you were talking, I was asking myself, okay, so we're talking about couples in space. Let's just start with Starship. We're on our way to Mars. Now, do we send one Starship or two? With, I mean, with the people. I mean, if we send one and one explodes, we lost everything. So it just occurs to me like every mission to Mars will be two Starships so that we can at least save 50% of the people just looks logical to me. So we have a couple. Do they fly together or separately? How many people on each ship? If we like send 20 people, it's 10 a ship, 10 per ship. Very lonely experience out there in the stars. What do you think of it? You're in the Navy. You know what it is to sail with a ship. (laughs) Man, I I have to admit that uh, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of couples, but they almost always, they're a ticking bomb. They're an obstacle. Uh, in in these environments, because unless most of your relationship has been already almost formed in in similar environments, then it doesn't, it's important that you're a couple, but this is going to be in your experience and a new way to stretch the limits and test your relationship, both because of the closed, isolated environment, but also in the context of being a couple in a team on a mission. The roles kind of blur or, or, or they need to be very well defined before you even go. In terms of what are your individual, let's say you're one of the couple uh, members, what are your individual priorities? Who would you follow loyalty-wise? Your commander, your partner? You, Raoud mentioned earlier, maybe the couple should be the commander and or in command because then you at least remove one one, one aspect of, of of maybe competing agendas and actually maybe even you kind of like foster this parenting also component where you're responsible for the entire team and it, it is kind of analog yeah so that's a, an interesting question uh, i think if you end up sending a couple knowing that you're saying a couple you're probably going to send them together rather than in separate i don't know i mean i think also the 
the mission support center or the mission control would be a very important component in that kind of a mission. So actually having the couple and having one in mission control and one on the ship is also actually an interesting setup for this type of mission, not to be the same on the same ship as well, but also taking care of one of another, making sure that everybody's still, you know, listening to Mother Earth, so on and so forth, which is a big issue with deep space missions, for instance, Neva. You know, there's in all, all, almost all Mars simulations and analog missions, you have a uh, delay in communication between the astronauts in the habitats and their mission control. Because as the planets go further apart, it takes a long time for communications to go. So between 8 to 20 minutes, depending where the planets are, one towards another. So you won't have constant communication with Earth. You're not going to have, oh, Houston, we have a problem. So we'll be like waiting for a very long time. So they're going to get independent from Earth very quickly. So then it becomes an issue of them and us. So you want to bridge that gap and maybe sending like making a setup with a couple, one in mission control, one on a ship is actually an interesting psychological play to overcome that gap. And obviously... You know, if if they have kids, you can't wow. fly the couple and leave the kids on Earth. So you're necessarily, if you're flying out a couple, you're necessarily flying a, a couple without kids, just putting it out there. Which is not a big issue these days, you know. I've, I've met a few female astronauts and they were actually pretty okay with the concept of not having children. They're married to their job. They love their career. They love being in space. Okay, not to have children for some mm, of them. It's a very good point. You mentioned that couples are potentially a ticking bomb. So let's dive a little bit into that topic. What if they fight? And you introduced the, the, the idea of a couple as the commanders, as the mother and father of, of the team. What if they fight? What if they break up? It's a long duration mission, right? How would it affect the rest of the team? Yeah, I think I actually, the more we talk about it, I like more the prospect of having the couple at the head of, like the head of the mission, the mission, because then they have, they have duties beyond themselves, right? So even, so I think it would lower the chances of them breaking up. And even if they, they would, they, they have a, a, a certain level of commitment where might help them put aside their interpersonal tackles. Obviously you, you can totally predict that, but you can try to, to minimize uh, the chances of it interfering with the mission. And this is my bias because I am on, on the route to become a clinical psychologist, but I think that there's really no way around facing emotional difficulties. We can we can select the most resilient people or the more most hardy hardy people. There's actually a measure called hardiness that is correlated with success in, in similar environments like in astronauts or special ops and stuff like that. But you can pick the people that are most hardy and most resilient, but still you're sending them on a three, four year mission, difficult mission, nonstop. You're always on duty. There's always something to be done almost intentionally, right? You all, Also, you want to keep them active. You don't want to let them just like wither away. I think there's no way around facing and dealing with difficult emotional situations. Now, the, the question is not if it's going to happen, it's what can you do about it when it happens? Interpersonal difficulties can be a, a factor that plays into it. It can also be a supportive and protective factor against it. When you have someone who can help you process these emotions, I would love to think that if there are will be couples on astronaut missions and specifically on astronaut missions where they're where they're pre-selected i hope that they would be able to put that aside i don't think it's going to be easy and i don't think it's going to be immediate but i think eventually they're, they're going to have to do that because they can't it's not like in real life on earth when you break up with someone and that's the last time you see them and you don't have oh. to think about them and you don't have to interact yeah. with them yeah exactly who gets the the final say about you know anything in space the highest uh, ranking officer yeah yeah it could be a, it could be the mom it could be the dad doesn't really matter as long as it's the highest ranking officer yeah and that's also something that not to to jump too deep into gender roles here but something that in the previous conversation you and i brought up kind of in passing is That's green gender conversation good point yeah. yeah so if you're if you're if you have any concern let's say you're you're taking couples on on your mission it doesn't need to be this first or second or third mission and so they have no kids right even though menstrual cycle happens to the best of our understanding naturally um in zero gravity most female astronauts choose to take contraceptives. And that's obviously a, a, we don't have a lot of research on the long-term use of contraceptive in space, but at least in the, sh in the relatively short term, we, we know it works. 
But if you have any concern of potential inception or, or pregnancy in space, then you could think about prioritizing LGBTQ couples where that chance is hopefully mitigated to some extent. If anything in couple, in couple relationship can endanger a mission to Mars, pregnancy is at the top of that list. It's gonna be hard on the entire team. It's going to eventually completely take away at least one person of the team. So there are a lot of medical considerations that play into it. Um, there, there are a lot of, you know, there, there, there are a lot that we, that we don't know about what are the consequences for a fetus in, in deep space, more so because of radiation than because of gravity. So we know from, from rat studies that rats can be, can become pregnant in space, can be born in space and then have a normal life on earth. We still don't have, to the best of my understanding, I think there, is, there isn't a full life cycle on space yet. I might be wrong, but at least like in, in the research 10 years ago, there hasn't been. There, there's some impacts on your vestibular system that there's delays in its development if you grow up in, in zero gravity and so on and so forth. We can put that aside for a second. What happens with radiation? Radiation it almost certainly will impact the fetus, whether it's making them sterile or actually have like birth defects or I don't High think- rate of abortion. So what you're saying, you're not saying it, I'm saying it. <laughs> we go to Mars. We spend two years there. We don't get pregnant because we don't want to take the risk. I think that's a fair assumption. And again, I'm gonna I'm gonna be back to talking about just radiation for now until we we figure that out. Obviously, there's a lot of a lot of other things we need to think about, like having a, the, the medical supplies and and support system that can support pregnancy, birth, and uh, raising a, a, a baby. In, in, on, a st on a starship, for example. Like, so okay. assuming that's going to be the base of the beginning. Are there any papers written on this? Uh, not to my knowledge that directly, at least not in the in a general scientific community, maybe there are internal papers at NASA or other space agencies that deal with that. But the FAA, for example, the, the, the Federal Aviation Association, it limits the exposure of pregnant, of pregnant women to one millisievert per pregnancy. On the Apollo missions, they were exposed to 1.2 millisieverts a day. So... Radiation is still a very big challenge in, yeah. in this, uh, in this uh, space theory about even if you had the Starship, it's still a huge huge problem which is why for instance like stemrad with lockheed martin you know developing their vest is a very important development for radiation protection during long voyages yeah. and short-term voyages and anybody who's not uh, super healthy right now would still like to to enjoy space and will need that kind of a protection as well so it's an important product and we still don't have a solution for it don't look so sad <laughs> i was just thinking about it. so <laughs> think, think happy topic of is there any any type of let's call it female medicine that we should consider while going to space is there any difference between men and women in terms of medicine and treatment in space nobody knows nobody knows not for the long term missions yeah for the, for the short term you know there is women women's health is one of the topics that every space agency have to do to to be Con, you know, cognizant of because they send women into space. But long term, exactly, nobody knows. Going back to the analog missions, that's why analog missions are so crucial because we we need to take into consideration the potential environmental effects on the hormonal system, which is very sensitive to light changes and sleep, potentially microgravity as well. We don't know. I mean, long term, you know. Again, I, I'm I'm bringing it in the context. Obviously, it's important for men's health as well, but in the context of women's health because we want understand what are the risks long-term risks obviously immediate risks and acute risks but also long-term risks how how being a part of a mission to mars what are some considerations that the female astronaut need to take into consideration and decide i'm taking that risk but we need to talk about those risks we don't know yet <laughs> unfortunately do you think there are any like special op analysis that some of the few special ops around the world units that might have women in it might have interesting analysis on that issue you know women in long duration under stressful conditions under physical duress as well that's probably a good place to look for some answers yeah I, I'm, I'm assuming there is literature i'm not i'm not sure that's not exactly my expertise so I can speak about it with, with certainty. I'm not sure that the physical duress is equivalent because actually, you know, at least an entire route to Mars, the time they spent on Mars and the way back, they're probably going to be under less physical duress than they would be on Earth. 
uh, there's you know zero gravity on the way there, a third of gravity on Mars. They're gonna hate every minute once they reach a gravity well. I mean, after your body adjusts to zero gravity, adjusting back even to a third of a gravity is, is yeah. hell on the it's hell on the body. And on Earth, it does take them a while, take them a while, and they need a lot of assistance actually just to be carried from one place to another. So that's another sort of like a difficult milestones for us to land when Mars. they land. Really, yeah. When, so if the team lands on Mars, will they be able to like first day start working or they're going to just sit in the spaceship for a couple that's, of days? That's, that was like one of the logics behind one of NASA proposal to, to have rovers and have like, I would say like quads for them and so on and so forth because they won't be able to do anything on, on, on their two wow. feet anyway. And they're going to use a lot. They will need some sort of mechanical and automation aid as well. And, uh, and exoskeletons would be really necessarily <laughs> necessary at that point. But there is still no solution for that. But yeah, after six, seven months in space, your body completely acclimates to this kind of environment and you're having a good time with it. But then you need to, to deal with reality and the, the reality is gravity. So it's going to be a big issue. Yeah. Anyway. And, and, just to, and just to make an input here about people who are wondering like how research in, in space can benefit people on Earth. If we get to develop an exoskeleton that is natural and working well, just think about the rehabilitation implications on Earth for that. The... the the, the benefit that people that cannot walk, cannot uh, limited in movement would benefit from that on earth. We, we knew it's a, it's a possibility on earth for a very long time. Only recently we see it really implemented in rehabilitation settings, but now you have another incentive to put money and in, in R&D into it, right? Because as you said, that's something you have to solve. Vote for exoskeletons. That's what I think. Just to, to close this. So basically, a fake here thinks that couples, unless it's like they're in command, you know, situation, then it's probably not a good idea to send couples. There's also the issue of radiation. Uh, so not, you have to take you know, family planning is, a, is an issue that needs to be addressed and, and be very, you know, absolute about it very confident about what you're saying there so he's and from a team perspective having a couple within it's a bit of an issue that this was a very interesting uh, solution to bring the to bring perhaps couples from the lgbt community when it comes to all the issues of pregnancy and so on and so forth anything else someone would like to add to the issue of couples on a team tomorrow should we go for the polyamoria kind of discussion thing or should we hold back i'm not sure <laughs> You know, you open the door, we can discuss a lot of, is it, is it like an opportunity to have a completely alternative, you know, lifestyle choices or we're more with, you know, legs on the ground and just a you... military operation and that's it. <laughs> Long term, maybe, I don't know. Maybe there's yeah. going to be a lot of women and only one man, you know, because women are much more durable during stressful situations. So we're going to survive on Mars and you won't. So therefore, there's going to be much more women. We need to think about that as well. I'm sure that that's something that we need to bring to the conversation long term. Uh, because even if you send, let's say, let's say you decide not to send couples or only send one couple, they're going to be there for four years. Of course, there are going to be relationships during the mission, of course. I, I know. I always hate how like Hollywoodic adaptations of space related stuff is always super melodramatic and everybody is like cheating on everyone and like... <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure it's going to look like that, yeah. but it's not entirely far-fetched. Um, and, and obviously, the one topic that we we should talk about, whether in monogamous couples or not, is the context of sex in space. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Okay, now we're going to let a big talk for like one hour, and we would not interrupt him anywhere. That's it. We don't know, <laughs> right? Sex in space, go. We don't know. I mean, there are a lot of rumors and there are a lot of, uh, you know, these books that come out every once in a while that say, you know, there are a lot of secret projects from NASA and uh, Roscosmos that send people to have sex in space and see what happens. And we can't know for sure. I don't think that's true. But the concept of having spa uh, sex in space is has interest humankind since the, the idea of being able to be in space became a reality or even before, you know. You know, you have Asimov writing a, an article about having sex in space and the benefits of low gravity. Oh, it was like in the 70s or something like that. Which, um, which, 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 which essay of Asimov? I thought I knew everybody. Oh, Sex in a Spaceship. Sex in a Spaceship. I'm going to look yeah. that up. 
for sure. Yeah, so people thought about that. I don't think we have uh, actual evidence for that. They're not published, that's for sure. <laughs> so they're not published yet, yeah. They're not published. Exactly. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened off radar. People think about that. I don't know if you, you have you ever heard about the two suit? <laughs> That's an interesting discussion. Uh, and the two suit, literally the number two in the word suit. I, I can't remember the person who developed it or what her credentials or experience, but the idea was to develop a garment that you can wear while in zero gravity that will assist you in the very difficult, f physically difficult act of having sex in space. Physically difficult from, from the context of laws of physics. Yeah. yeah. Newton's laws and... <laughs> oh my God, there's like a Wikipedia thing on it. There is. Oh my God. You're welcome. God. <laughs> oh my okay, God. Okay, dive in. Tell us, tell us more. <laughs> No, I just, listen, this is amazing. It was invented by Vanna Bonta in 2006. Wow. And the yeah. first suit was manufactured and tested. So uh, the History Channel had a, a, a yeah. show called Universe, The Universe, and they had a whole episode about that too. Soon. Oh, Niv, you have to. You have to get that. <laughs> Niv. So there's not a lot of pictures here on the video. It, it has been tested in, in the zero, in the, in the gravity comet. This is insane. I didn't know this. And did it work? Do you remember like what was the end conclusion? Because the last reference is from 2000 and maybe 12. I, I can't really remember, you know, this. it was an old show, older show, not an old show, but um, they actually tested it in the Vomit Comet, in the, in the zero gravity plane. Right. So, and how did it go? I, <laughs> Where I, did I the vomit say. go? <laughs> was there uh, vomit? I hope not. People think about it. That's the successful... point. No, 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 no. Sorry, we, we're not passing it. How do you test like a successful... So zero G, you know, it's like you go up and down, right? For se like several times. And you have maybe like zero G, you have microgravity conditions for maybe 20 seconds or something like that. So you have multiple times of 20 seconds where you sort of like float inside. On the, the plane. You're talking about on the plane. the plane. Yeah, in the plane in zero G flight. Yeah. So I'm thinking... So you're already in the garment with your partner and you're waiting for those 20 seconds to, to do what? That's the question here. How do you test a successful... Niv, how would you test this? Come on, you're the creative oh, guy. Come on. With, in 20 seconds, not going to happen. Not going to happen. I mean... But maybe you get warm so, up for like, you know, like five minutes where you go up and down, up and down, and then you're going to get to those... So there are, there are other solutions for that. There, there, okay. there are rumors. There are rumors, uh -huh. I don't know if they're true, that Virgin yeah. Galactic denied a, I don't know, like a, a million dollar offer from some group to shoot yeah. a an Four adult film. Probably. That would solve the 20 second issue. And there's the crowdfunding campaign uh, that never succeeded, filming an adult film in space. To be honest, it's it's a matter it's a matter of time. At some point, if, if that early, that's where people are pushing for. We'll get the answer about how you do it sooner or sooner rather than later. What's it like to orgasm in zero gravity? And what happens when you get it on an outer space? I bet you'd like to know. Like, for me, you know, they're already, you know, at least in the International Space Station, you see all these, you know, sleeping bags. So eventually you're just going to have like a bigger sleeping bag and you're going to put two people in it. And that's it, I think, no? If you're looking at men, it, it's only a matter of blood cir circulation, right? Oh, I didn't think about that. It's blood circulation. So if you can solve erection in space, then basically, then you need your brain to work, right? Yeah, I think that's not a problem actually in space. That's a good but, question. Uh, but this is a fascinating topic. It comes up in every analog astronaut conference or whatever webinar that I've heard of. And I think it's about time the public would get some answer, don't you? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, it's not going to be fun on the ISS because it's going to be steamy and hot <laughs> and uh, your sweat doesn't go anywhere. Is there a lot of noise in the space station? Mm -hmm. and clicking and yeah, it's a lot of electrostatic as well. So all, all the equipment needs to be cooled. So there are a lot of cooling equipment that's constantly running and AC that's constantly running mm -hmm. and the purifying systems that are constantly running. So there's always some electrical machinery that's constantly running. constantly running. That's crazy. Imagine that you need to fly to space and then fly for seven months and suddenly you're on Mars and it's quiet. Maybe some humming from a little bit of wind. I don't know. But suddenly it's quiet after months that you're on Starship. Also thinking about how it would feel not to see Earth. 
Definitely. But not to be able to even know the direction of home. Okay. Michael Collins um, described it when he went to the far side of the moon when he was circling the moon waiting for the guys on the, the landing part in it. And he said, that time when I was on the other side of the moon, there were no communications because the moon blocks everything and he didn't see Earth. And he said at the time, I was the only human being ever. And that's every time someone passes the far side of the moon, that's it. It's connected from Earth. So on Mars, it's going to be quadruple that. That's pretty incredible. Okay, I think uh, we've... Uh... We have enough, you sure? <laughs>